We're so honoured having Dr. Quinda here with us today as the acting HPCSA Registrar and CEO and the HPCSA Ombudsman. He has a biography literally as long as my arm, but apart from being a qualified family physician, I'm not sure whether you knew that Dr. Quinda is also a third level LLB student. Who would have guessed? He's also an ordained pastor in the ministry. And when I spoke to him earlier this week, it became really apparent that this is a, a true calling for him and not just something, to use his words, that happens on a Sunday. We know you're an extremely busy man, so apart from all your HPCSA activities, we would really just like to commend you for making yourself available to talk to us today. Dr. Quinda, thank you very much and welcome. A familiar Thank you, Lani, and, and, and beyond all the colleagues. That's a great pleasure. It's lovely having you here. A familiar face also joining us this afternoon again is Dion Bish, the director of ProfNet Medical and part of the executive at SpaceNet Global Group, who's also sponsoring today's webinar with EasyMed support. And lo and behold, believe it or not, it is accredited for one ethics point. My name, as you know, um, is Lani Ace, and I'm a product manager also at the SpaceNet Global Group. And as per usual, I'll be your host this afternoon. Now, over the last two weeks, we've been discussing ethical billing. And what was supposed to be only one session turned out to be two sessions because of the overwhelming response that we received from you, all the attendees. Now, there has been a lot of questions around the, the positioning of the HPCSA the rights of schemes with regards to forensic audits and forensic investigations, and also this perception from the health professional side about potential bullying tactics from the schemes or the administrator. Now, Dr. Quinda, if I may ask you perhaps to share some of your thoughts around this, and also maybe if you can bring in the 2017 document, which talks around how practitioners should behave and can respond to some of these forensic investigations or audits. Please, if we may have your thoughts. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think, I, think uh, I mean, colleagues will remember that the, the, the issue about how the medical schemes are, are implementing the provisions of Section 59 of the Medical Schemes Act is currently part of the Section 59 investigation or commission and we are still awaiting a report from, from that particular commission but at the time when we we had to guide practitioners uh, i think as you said uh, 2017 mm -hmm. we were trying to to assist uh, under the circumstances and as a regulator we we look at things both sides uh, i think what is very clear is that we are not a representative of the practitioners, but a regulator. And I'm saying this because in, in, in the thick of things, of things, you do still find practitioners who are fraudulent. We can't run away from that. I mean, sure. through our systems, we know there are practitioners who are fraudulent. Not all practitioners are fraudulent. And, 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 and there's a provision of the law in terms of Section 59 on how the schemes can be able to, to recover money that has been paid, bona fide, or due to error, or due to fraudulent activities. And that is where really most of the things uh, end up going wrong. And I think uh, for us, it was a matter of saying, how, how do you behave as a practitioner? And what provisions are there that will guide you on how you react? Now, what we are all aware of is that irrespective of how a practitioner respond within the law, what actually happens at the end is that then the schemes decide how to deal with the practitioner. And, and one of the ways that we have seen happening, which many practitioners really uh, suffer in terms of their business and so on, is when the schemes decide not to pay the practitioner directly if the practitioner does not give them the information uh, that they want. So they stop direct payment. Mm -hmm. And when they stop direct payment, they can continue to pay the patient directly. And we all know when that money drops into the patient's account, 
uh, the last person that they will think of is a practitioner who have rendered a service for them. They think of all the gaps that they have financially and they cover that before they can pay the practitioner. So ours is just to, to guide the practitioners on how to handle those issues. And, and that is what we do. And let me go further and say, we have, of course, uh, uh, followed these things and try to establish also relationships with both the Council for Medical Schemes where we do realize that things are getting out of hand because we do not regulate uh, medical schemes. They are regulated by the Council for Medical Schemes. And all we can do is to make the Council for Medical Scheme aware of certain acts that we think are irregular and see if they can take action. You know, they are an independent regulator from us. We can dictate to them how to deal with those who register with them. So that is what we do. And also, one of the things that we have done, and this is the engagement that I had with most of the medical schemes uh, through the Board of Healthcare Funders, because the challenge that we have is the way these matters are handled and when complaints are sent to us. So we had to have common minds in terms of the approach uh, that we use. I'll give you a practical example. Please do. Uh, is, is that most of the times when we complaints are lodged to us, that particular practitioner has already closed the business to a point where even when we embark on an investigation, <laughs> in fact, uh, the discussion that we have had recently was, is it necessary to even investigate? Because most of these cases you travel, for example, from Pretoria to Deben, our investigators are really driving on the road going to that practice. When they arrive there, they are told, no, this person closed the practice two years ago. And we ask ourselves then, is it worth it to be committing HPCSA resources to those investigations because the schemes will have done their own investigation. They will have done their own interventions. And by the time they come to us, the practitioner has already left that particular area and they are starting to find a way of surviving somewhere else. So that is basically some of the, our experiences that we have been having. But let me also do mention that uh, we do have colleagues really who are, who are fraudulent. Uh, and the challenge that we have is that uh, most, let me say, by the way, most of the preliminary committees of inquiry uh, agendas, especially for what we call small boards, which is basically the majority of you who are here. The majority of the cases that are being considered in those boards, I can say plus or minus 60%, of the items on the agenda are related to fraud. Mm. And indeed, there are practitioners who are found guilty of fraud. And of course, the boards will take the appropriate action. Of course, that is a reality. That's why mm. as a regulator, when we look at this matter, we need to look at the facts. And, and we do understand that really there are things that the medical schemes are doing uh, of harassing and bullying uh, uh, practitioners. But yeah. at the same time, we really do have our colleagues who are also fraud stars. That is a reality. So it's Dr. an issue of really bringing a balance to that. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Kwende, thanks. I've, I've got two questions, but just before I jump in, thanks again for joining us. It really is an honor having you here with us. Mm -hmm. um, um, Dr. Kwende, the, I mean, I'm going to ask a question. I think I do know the answer to it, but what jurisdiction does a medical scheme have over a healthcare practitioner in the way that they practice clinically? in dictating how they practice clinically and in their choice of clinical intervention with a patient. Do they have a jurisdiction over that? Um, uh, or is that under the auspices of the HPCSA? That's the first part. And that's got a second part is that should the medical schemes not be referring these cases to the HPCSA earlier rather than waiting until practices have to close uh, before it actually gets escalated? A very interesting question, <laughs> Dion. You see, if, if, you, if you look at the definition of, of, of professionalism, mm. and I think Cruz and Cruz uh, in defining professionalism, there are things that they emphasized in the definition of professionalism. Yeah. And, and some of those things are one, the issue of self-regulation. Yeah. 
That's why we self-regulate as health professionals. Yeah. We set standards for each other. And when one of us violate those standards, uh, mm. that is the basis for discipline. Yeah. It's like calling each other to say, but this is not how we do things sure. in this profession. Mm. Sure. But w w one of the things is the monopoly of practicing our health professions. That's why mm. anyone who practices the health professions for which they have to be registered with the HPCSA, it becomes a criminal offense. Yes. But very importantly is the issue of professional autonomy. Yeah. And that is where your question is based on. Mm. Uh, to say you are autonomous as a practitioner. Yeah. By being a health professional, it means you possess a certain knowledge and skills which is complex, mm -hmm. not readily available to ordinary members of the public. Yeah. That's why your autonomy in practicing mm -hmm. your profession need to be respected, but it also needs to be protected. Yes. So that is where now the whole issue uh, uh, starts in terms of saying, then why do medical schemes now start to intervene with the way I treat my patient? And it all really comes in because the medical scheme is the one that is supposed to pay yes. for that particular treatment. And that is where now the lines become black. Mm. That's why from our side, and I'm happy that the past two weeks you have been dealing with the issues of billing. Sure. That's why on our side as the HPCSA, we say when it comes to your fees and how you deal with fees with your patients. There are two duties that you need to discharge as a practitioner. You inform your patient about the cost of services yeah. and you issue them with a statement of account. Mm. And that is how we judge you if you have fulfilled your duty as sure. a practitioner. How mm. the patient pays you, it mm. depends on the patient. Yeah. But if they know how much you are going to charge for the service, yeah. then they are liable to pay you even if the scheme pay less. Yeah. I always say yeah. <laughs> there's no one who can decide for a practitioner how much a practitioner should charge. It's the practitioner yes. who decides. Yes. But the schemes then come in and determine yeah. how much you are worth. A practitioner sure. needs to determine how much they are worth. Sure. And all you need to do is to inform your patient about that. Mm -hmm. So, and then afterwards, issue the patient yeah. with a statement of account. Those two things yeah. are critical on how we judge all the matters that comes before the HPCSA. But I, having I, said that, yeah. let me just say, mm. before I come back to you, Dion, yes. that one of the things is in terms of, you know, there's a difference between a medical scheme, an administrator, or, and a managed healthcare organization. Oh. <laughs> And, and that is where, you know, things get a little bit bled. Mm. Who is supposed to request information about the patient from a practitioner? A what does scheme. Section 59 say? It says a medical scheme. Yeah. Mm. Now, is it supposed to be a managed healthcare organization? Because that section, in fact, not, it's, it's in, fact in the regulations. Yes. Uh, those regulations refers to a managed health organization. A medical scheme can request information from a medical, a, a managed health care organization. Now, those are areas that we really need to look at who is requesting yeah. that confidential information between the patient. Mm. And I don't want to even call that person a member because it's not a member of the medical scheme in front of a, a health professional. It's a patient. How they deal with their medical aid is up to them. Yeah. Now, when you come to the issue of jurisdiction, it's very clear in the regulations and also in the Medical Schemes Act. Uh, they all respect the jurisdiction that uh, the HPCSA has over practitioners. But let me also be honest with you. And being honest with you is that we as the HPCSA, and I'm saying this and I know I'm speaking from facts here, that in the way we have dealt with these matters of fraud mm. has also complicated how the whole industry or sector is managing this issue because when somebody, let's be honest, when, when there is fraud, mm -hmm. there's also prejudice. Somebody has suffered loss. And I'm talking about where indeed there was fraud. 
-hmm. it will not be sufficient for a matter to be finalized at a prelim, preliminary committee of inquiry, because a preliminary committee of inquiry cannot order a sanction of a restitution. Mm -hmm. Meaning that if somebody has defrauded a scheme, let's say, for example, 2 million rand, because we do have those cases. Yeah. And yeah. the person is found guilty of fraud. Mm -hmm. And you say, we fine you. The maximum fine that can be imposed is 70,000. Well, out of the 2 million that has been defrauded. Mm -hmm. sure. And that money does not go to the scheme. It goes to the HPCSA coffers. Mm -hmm. So the scheme still lose. And let's be honest, the schemes are not interested in the fines imposed. They are interested in the money coming into their pockets. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and one of the things is we also, and we, we have been trying this process last year, since last year, where we say, indeed, if there's fraud, that matter cannot be finalized at prelim. It must go to a professional conduct inquiry so yeah. that if indeed the practitioner is found guilty of fraud, they can also impose a penalty of restitution where they have to return the money mm -hmm. that they have gained through fraudulent activities. Because okay. HPCS is the one that, that has got that jurisdiction. So, so, so two things on that. So what the schemes would often do with the administrators, as you rightly point out, um, would actually say to you, um, we've quantified what we feel the exposure or the loss or the, the, the prejudice that we've suffered um, in a RAND value term. In order to settle this case, you need to sign this, and they often call it an acknowledgement of debt. Um, what is the legal position about an acknowledgement of debt versus an acknowledgement of guilt? You see, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Yes. Uh, and, and, and that question look, uh, look a little bit complicated for an ordinary medical practitioner like me. <laughs> all, all, all I can say, Dion, is, is that definitely when you acknowledge that, yeah. you are really exactly doing that. And as to how the debt came about, yes. that is where now the issue of being guilty yes. also mm -hmm. comes into the picture. Okay. Now, you, when, when you acknowledge debt, you can acknowledge a debt that you, you, you find yourself in through normal and legal means. Mm -hmm. As to the issue of you acknowledge that you are guilty of something, that is a different ballgame yes, altogether. Yeah. But I will just really talk about you acknowledge that uh, I, I've got a debt against you, yeah. which I'm going to pay back. Okay. And, and it goes back beyond to Section 159 again. Yes. How are schemes supposed to recover the money that has been paid to a practitioner bona fide in error or fraudulently? The act is clear on how that is supposed to happen. And is that working for the schemes? It's another question. So that's the answer. section 59 of the Medical Schemes Act you're referring to? Yeah, section 59 of the Medical Schemes Act. Mm -hmm. Because it's very clear to say they need to recover that money from subsequent <laughs> patients. Yes. Meaning that if they realize that they paid you for patient A in mm -hmm. error, when patient B comes, patient B will receive a statement from the medical scheme that says Dion has been paid. But Dion won't find the money in his account because yeah. the scheme has recovered that money from the money that was paid in error yeah. from patient A. Yeah. But does that work? Practitioners will also become smarter and mm -hmm. become a cash practice. Exactly. And so when you come to my practice, you pay cash, I give you a statement of account, you go and mm -hmm. claim from your scheme. Yeah. So, and yeah. If, if it involves more than 100 rands, 100,000 yeah. rands, yeah. The, 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 the act that deals with combating of corrupt activities, mm -hmm. prevention and combating of corrupt activities act, section 34 says that if there's fraud, amounting to 100,000 and above, you must also report this matter to SAPS. Yeah. Yeah. Now, sure. does they, they recover the money? Something else. So those are the realities that are there. So, so just on one of the points you made about medical schemes saying how much you can charge for services and that you, in fact, are contracting with a patient directly with your informed financial consent and the patient knows what uh, financial exposure they, they, they will incur through your services um, and that you use that to test. I've had a very scary call earlier in this week from a practitioner who was saying that in engagements with a forensic department at a, at a scheme administrator, um, the statement was made that, but your practice charges on average 30% more than your peers, um, as if that was a, 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 
a concern that had to be raised and that they needed to normalize. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> you see, it's, it's, it's not the duty of the scheme to determine yeah. how much you must charge. That, that, yeah. That's why our Section 53 is very clear. Mm. And I said earlier on, did you inform your patient about the cost of services? Yeah. If yeah. the patient thinks that you are overcharging, they approach your board to mm. make that determination. And for the board to make that determination, they must develop and publish the norm mm. uh, within which you are supposed to charge, which is something that no board in the HPCSA has done so. Yeah. And when you look at how you run your practice, there are lots of things that you look at. I, mean, I always give an example and say, if you are operating in a mall, yeah. there's no way your fees are going to be the same with somebody operating in downtown. It's not the same. Mm. The cost of running your practice in the mall are higher than the cost of running your practice in the downtown. So for somebody to say, you know, you are charging more than your peers, that is not in order. At the end of the day, I charge what I charge depending on the cost of running my practice. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that is how practitioners are judged by the HPCS. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, it can be very yeah. interesting. That, I mean, it's fundamental to all of this, and, and, and perhaps this is a side question, um, and I know this has come up before, Dr. Kunda, so I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but a lot of this is, 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 is pivoted around a fee-for-service model, um, a model that I've done ultrasound on a patient and then I charge that fee, um, and it's almost a menu itemized list. What are your thoughts around the fee-for-service structure and possible alternative reimbursement models where practitioners have actually got skin in the game to, um, to, to, to rather contract on a fee-for-outcome or fee-for-value rather than a, than a fee-for-service? What, what are your thoughts around that? And I think, uh, Dion, it really goes back to the issue of what are we paying for? Mm -hmm. Are we paying for, for an activity or an input? Yeah. Or we are paying for a process? Mm -hmm. Or are we paying for the output or the, the output, uh, the outcome? Yeah. I mean, it, it is all about that. And the question is, where do we put more value? Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it's, it's a discussion that we need to start to look at as, as, as professionals to say, are we more interested in the activities that we are involved in the, the inputs that we are putting in, are we interested in the process that will give us the output? Are we gonna put more value in what we put in or in the process or the output or the outcome? Sure. And it goes back really to say, I mean, I, I, I like the discussion about alternative reinvestment model, but here's my point, mm -hmm. not driven by the funders, uh -huh. no. driven by the professionals. The professionals themselves saying to each other, guys, we can't be talking about, I mean, you can, you, can, you, can, you can operate on somebody or you can do physio on somebody, you discharge them, but they still come back because you have not done a good job. Sure. So what you have already claimed you have been paid, but the patient keeps on coming back. You talk about a readmission rate. Those are things that we need to start to look at. What is the readmission rate of the patient that we have operated on? So for me, alternative reinvestment model is the discussion that is necessary mm -hmm. because for a long time, fee for services not necessarily bring good outcomes. Mm -hmm. And we need to advance to look at whatever we are doing, do we have positive outcomes coming out of that? But can yeah. this be driven by professionals? I mean, why do we have professional associations? And we can't take over this responsibility ourselves yeah. and allow uh, the funders mm. to, to take over the discussion that is supposed to happen at a professional level. Can't agree more. I can't agree more. And, and I think the, the beauty of everyone that's on this call is we might all um, have one hat that says we're healthcare professionals, um, but we are all patients as well. And we can exactly. resonate with the patient side of things. And I know as a patient, I'm not looking to pay a, a fee for a service that's provided. I want to pay for an outcome. And I typically seek healthcare when I'm either in pain or I've got some kind of functional limitation or inhibition um, that I need to improve on. And I, and I trust we can move to a third part to say I want to prevent or I want to take care of my health before I get sick so we can move to a healthcare system rather than a, a wait for a sick care system. And yeah. those are the three components. And and I, I would be more, more than happy to, as, a, as a patient to pay for... Um, 
uh, the fact that I can sleep through the night without pain um, because I'm paying for that outcome rather than just the fact that you pressed here or did the following services or did the following assessment or the following rehabilitation or the following surgery. I guess that's really what we're looking for, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Dion, you keep mentioning patients here and I want to chip in here with a, a question from the, from the audience. Um, and it's, it's around the public and education around the public. Should there be, do you think, a greater awareness amongst patients who is the public about how to check whether a healthcare provider is indeed registered and what is involved with that registration process? Hmm. Very interesting one. From the Health Professions Council? From the Health Professions Council. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> of, of, of course, uh, you, you, you see all, all, all these things, you know, patient education, let's be honest, it's, it's a challenge. And I even want to take it further to member. When a patient is a member of the scheme, the last time they see the broker is the time when they sign in those papers. Mm. And what remains really, uh, patients look at their health professionals to tell them issues even pertaining to the benefits that they have with their medical schemes while practitioners are not involved in that. Yeah. So really at the end of the day, mm. patients are not well educated. Right from the point of even knowing. Re remember, the, the reality is patients, they, I mean, respect health professionals. When you are there in your practice, they, they just assume that this person is legit. Mm. They don't even know the issues of whether you have been suspended by the HPCSA or not. Of course, we try to do that in our roadshows. By the way, we do roadshows. We do talk, uh, we do uh, buy slots in the, in the, in the radios, GCIS mm. and so on. To, to educate uh, members of the public, but we can only go to a particular level. Uh, if we were to cover really the way we we'll want to cover in terms of uh, public members of the public education, then we may have to increase your annual fees, uh, you know, to do that. And mm -hmm. practitioners will not like it to, for their annual fees to be increased to educate members of the public, but uh, maybe to guide them. So we need to strike the balance because at the end of the day, when we educate members of the public, it also, to a certain extent, reduces also unnecessary complaints that are lodged against practitioners. So we do, we do that, but it is quite a very low scale compared to what we love to do because there are also limited resources to do that. Sure. Maybe sticking to payment, and this might be a controversial question, so potentially apologies in advance, but it's a question from the audience about the annual fees to, to stay registered with the HPCSA. Um, and this one is specifically with regards to psychology. Um, and I think it goes to something that you said earlier. Um, when the HPCSA is a regulator, but you also said that the healthcare professionals need to self-regulate. Um, the question is, what in essence is the psychologist paying for when they are registering with the HPCSA? And I'm quoting this, especially as ethical providers. So... <laughs> Very interesting. You know, when you talk about self-regulation, uh, in fact, you are regulating yourself. Let me give, put it this way. The HPCS, that's why I said it's a privilege of self-regulation. Mm -hmm. In other words, this privilege can be taken away. And the privilege being taken away, it means that other people who are not health professionals will regulate us. Now, if you are given a privilege, should those who have given you a privilege pay for the privilege? No, that's why the HPCSA is not funded from government. All the money that the HPCSA has come from practitioners because we self-regulate. That's why where we are right now, even if a complaint is lodged against you, with the consumer commissioner. They refer it to us because we are self-regulating. So they bring it to us because we are self-regulating. And mm. they know we are best positioned to deal. Can, 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 can I, can just a second. <laughs> Not a problem, we'll give him a, a second to join us again. Um, Dion, you've obviously got um, your, your own personal thoughts and we have to just state that it is your personal opinion with regards to fee-for-service and I think we sort of touched on that. Um, sure. Perhaps you could just sort of elaborate a little bit more on that. 
Absolutely. Um, I think that uh, looking back, and I, I think I've been saying it for quite a few years, is that we really do need to challenge ourselves and our thinking around fee-for-service and look at alternative reimbursement models. And I think practitioners often very quickly jump to, when I say alternative reimbursement models, the first thing that comes to mind is global fees. But there are many other models. It's just alternative to fee-for-service. Sure. So there's global fees, there's per diem rates, there's fee-for-outcome, there's fee-for-value. Um, there are a lot of other ways of doing these. And uh, I can't support Dr. Kunde more to say these should be driven, designed um, around evidence or best practice guidelines with clear outcome measures about when one achieves that outcome that one's looking for in the alternative reimbursement model. Um, and that must be driven by the clinicians, um, sure. by the profession for the profession, um, and, and looking at best practice or, or evidence-based uh, uh, guidelines on that. So, okay. so and, and the sad thing is, I think very often we hear um, that, 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 that practitioners are jumping up and down saying, but the schemes are doing this and the schemes are doing that. Um, they're asking me for my outcome measures and so on. And unfortunately, very often in most cases, um, it is the scheme stepping up in a space where there's been a leadership vacuum. There's been a, an absence of, of direction and they are forced to make a call about the direction they're taking um, because they're trying to protect a kitty, a, a, a treasury of money by its members to apply to appropriate health care. Um, and, and I think the, the, the appeal goes out to associations and societies again to say, we need to be stepping into that, taking the leadership, taking the ownership, being autonomous and saying that this is best practice, this is evidence, this is how it's going to be delivered. And we're putting our, our necks on the block. Um, there are outcomes that, we, that we're looking at rather than just leaving it to each practitioner to their own devices and then, then being surprised when any other entity, whether it's the HBCSA, the Department of Health, a medical scheme or its administrator stepping in and saying, right, there's chaos here, we're gonna try and, try and create some clarity. Sure, sure. Thank you. Dr. Kuna, thanks for joining us again. Sorry uh, about that. No, not a problem. <laughs> We're all working from home with different issues. <laughs> I, just want to take, I just want to take one step back because we started touching on something, but I don't think we completely closed the loop. And then I actually want to move on to the next topic. But mm. obviously, when a healthcare practitioner um, acted fraudulently, there's a certain course of action that needs to be taken to correct that. And I completely agree with that. However, there are healthcare providers out there as well who know that they acted and they build ethically. But still, some of the schemes or the administrators, that's another conversation, they actually came across as, as sort of strong arming the, the healthcare provider. Are there any practical advice from your side? what that healthcare practitioner or provider needs to be doing when they honestly feel that they have not done anything wrong. Do they approach the HBCSA or do they approach their relevant society or association? No, th I, I, th thanks for, for asking that question, Elani. And, and it's one of the things that I think practitioners need to be proud of. Um, what we have done now as the HPCSA, in, I mean, for a long time, we never had a unit in the HPCSA that deals with matters of professional practice. And, and we have since established that unit now, where you, I, I think during the time of the, I think the, what you are referring to in 2017 or 2018, that was the year when we established that unit. Although at that particular time, I was running that, that unit, although it was not even in the structure of the HPCSA, Mm. But we have taken that over now. It is in the structure of the HPCSA where you have a division called professional practice with a head of division and staff members who are looking at all mm. the issues that mm. practitioners raise. Now, it is through that unit that now we are able to engage with the Council for Medical Schemes, as I oh. said earlier, that when those things come up, if a practitioner is being bullied and so on, mm. Uh, you, you, you write to that particular unit, professional practice at hpcsa.co.za, and then we take it over from there. If there be a need for us to write directly to the registrar of the Council for Medical Schemes, we, we do so. But I also have to say, we also do have a relationship with BHF. We, most of the times, part of the engagements, especially during the fraud waste and abuse in Davos. We go and attend those one and we engage with the schemes at that particular level and raise our concerns. They also raise their concerns. That's why I'm in a position to know that indeed 
some of our, our practitioners, of course, are a disappointment to the profession. But so those platforms are there. And I want to say to practitioners, when you experience that, uh, you can really write to professional practice at hpcsa.co.za or even uh, directly to the head of division, Mpo M. I'm, I'm mentioning this because it's easy. Mpo M at hpcsa.co.za. And then you, you can write directly to him as the head of division and he will ensure that he attends to the matter. And we have seen it works yes. because we can That's call the scheme. And, mm. and let me say lastly, uh, Lani, that, I mean, the schemes and the administrators are not the same person. The administrators are, that's why I always say, the schemes are not for profit, but administrators are for profit. Mm. That is the reality. We can't run away from that, that reality. Mm. Mm. Administrators are for profit. The schemes are not for profit. Yeah. And they contract with the schemes as a for profit. Mm. Uh, organization. That is the reality. So that's why all these things do happen. So mm, mm. thank you. No, thank you. And that, I think that's a very practical tip that you gave them as well with the email address. Thank you so much. If, if I can maybe just attest to that, and I've, I've certainly heard this from the roadshows, and I can really just underpin to say, please guys, attend those roadshows. They're really of, of exceptional value. Um, you know, getting a really direct answer from the podium about can I bill for appointments not kept? Um, what is touting? Um, how do I avoid that? What can I advertise? There's really straight shooting answers um, that come from those podiums. So please attend. And one of them was the, the email address you've just given, if we can maybe give that again. Mm. But um, I, 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 then, I then tested that after the first roadshow. Um, and uh, and the, I've had a response within 10 days. Um, we also tested from, because we had quite a few practitioners coming to us and saying, um, we got a challenge because the regulation currently states that you need handwritten notes. That's the wording. And uh, we know that the regulation was written before some of the technology we currently have. Um, and I'm using a system like EasyMed or another practice management system where I'm capturing notes um, electronically into my device. It's not handwritten. Am I in contravention of the regulation? And I then took that through to the HPCSA through that same channel, through that email address. And we got an incredible response within 10 days. So I really want to encourage everyone out there to, to utilize those challenge, those channels um, because it really is incredible in how the HPCSA is stepping up in guiding the professionals. Perfect. Thank you, Dion. Thank you, Dion. Um, some of the questions that came through as well relate to cases that's been reported at the HPCSA, either by patients or by colleagues of healthcare professionals, being healthcare professionals or healthcare providers themselves. Perhaps you can just share a couple of your thoughts about some of the more recent cases that you've experienced. And also maybe alongside with that is why does some of the, the evaluations or the investigations around these cases, why does it take so long? <laughs> Not my question. <laughs> Came from the audience. I, I think I, I, one of the things that we, we have done really since April last year, by the way, I'm happy to announce that the, the head of division for our complaints uh, handling unit is a physio. Oh, wow. Uh, we, we appointed her on the 1st of April this year. And, and what we have since done since last year, because re remember before our, our investigations were done by uh, legal, uh, let me say, people with legal qualifications. Mm -hmm. And we have since changed that with the turnaround, okay. where now uh, our investigators are health professionals. Mm. Currently in our team of investigators, we have got a physio, we have got an optometrist, we have got, in fact, we have got two optometrists, okay. we have got uh, two people who are in the speech, language and hearing uh, profession, we have got an environmental health practitioner, so we, we, those are our investigators and where we need certain skills. I mean, uh, the act empowers the registrar to appoint a person who is not in the employment of the HPCSA to assist with that particular investigation. Now your question says, why were investig are investigation taking such a long time? And, and, and indeed it, it has to, it's multifactorial. And I will tell you why. Uh, it, it, there is a preliminary inquiry process that can be longer than normal. And when a matter goes to an inquiry process, then it becomes too legalistic mm -hmm. at that level where um, for a matter to set down, 
there are lots of issues that are raised as points in limine and all those kind of things. But as it is right now, there is a commitment that at least within a period, and, and I'm saying within a period of eight months, a matter should have gone through a preliminary in, a inquiry process. It may sound longer. The reason being that, remember the regulations stipulates that for a practitioner to respond, a practitioner must be given 40 days. Mm. Now 40 days is plus or minus two months already. Sure for a practitioner to respond. Mm. So the two month is already taken by the time given to the practitioner to respond. Of course, you do have practitioners who will quickly respond within 10 days. So it's easier to deal with those. Ones. So those matters will be dealt with speedily. And after that, the matter must go and serve before a preliminary committee of inquiry. That means every three months. So you can imagine when you submit your explanation today and the committee just met yesterday mm. it means that matter must wait for three months more and when the matter serves you may find that the committee decides that no we want to consult with this practitioner or we still need this information which is something that has improved you know we have been tracking the case deferral rate for further information because case deferral rate for further information means that the investigation was not proper but that has since reduced dramatically. Sure. The only thing that is remaining now is when the committee says, we are not clear about this explanation, we want to consult with this practitioner, so this practitioner should come in our next meeting. So we found that the matter now is going into six months, eight months, 10 months sometimes, and that is where the delays come from. But there is a commitment uh, from our side in secretariat in terms of the investigation and also a commitment that at least within eight months, the matter should have gone through the preliminary inquiry process. So that is where the delays come from sometimes, but we have really been working on that and matters are moving faster than before. Perfect, thank you. There's a lot of questions that come up with regards to the email address. I'm just quickly gonna repeat it again. If you need to reach out to the HPCSA, the email address and person that you can contact there directly is Mpo M at hpcsa.co.za. Have I got that right, Dr. Quinda? Perfect. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll also give them professional practice at hpcsa.co.za. So if you send professional practice at hpcsa.co.za and copy poem, you will be fine. Perfect, it's nice to know that there's a, a person at the end of that email that's actually receiving it. <laughs> Only, I, 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 I am if you feel like this, like this question there because I think it ties in. No, no, go, Dion. I wanted to say that. Off you go. It's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Kunda, um, Lucky's got a question um, that, is, that, is, that is asking that uh, the implications of signing an acknowledgement of guilt at prelim inquiry level, guilty or not, a conviction or not, is, the, is his wording. Okay. <laughs> of course, of course. When, 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 when you sign an acknowledgement, it goes back to say, how did the debt come about? Is it through fraudulent activities? But let me be honest with you. What we have seen, in fact, is that <laughs> in most of the times it works for practitioners because uh -huh. we, we, we have seen even in professional conduct inquiries where in, 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 in putting together a sanction, even at prelim, they do consider how much you have already paid to the scheme. Okay. And, 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 and we have even argued that because you see, you see what happens with the scheme and how they impose a penalty on the price. Those are two separate issues. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you because it's a peer review process, colleagues are able to understand each other. And in most of the times, I have seen it working more for practitioners. Mm -hmm. The fact that in fact, they've already paid something through an acknowledgement of debt to the scheme while the scheme is lodging a complaint, then the committee does consider that this practitioner has already yeah. paid. So it, it will be sufficient to say, in some cases, caution and reprimand. In some, that is the worst case scenario in terms of, you know, you can't caution a fraudster. You need to mm -hmm. be a little bit uh, heavy handed uh, to, to correct uh, such a behavior. But yeah. we have seen the committees really considering that. But it does come in in terms of you acknowledging that indeed, you are indebted to the scheme by that mm. acknowledgement. And 
I know practitioners do that because really the worst case scenario that you think of is, am I going to lose my license? What is going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. So, True. so the the, the committees the committees really look at all that holistically. Mm -hmm. All right. I just want to read a message that we received from Rosella, and it's, it's maybe just a comment, it's not really a, a question, but it's perhaps a good idea to inform the public, um, is to also offer webinars from the HPCSA, because certain areas in the country are actually neglected, and I don't think it just goes towards the public, it's towards the healthcare professionals that is actually registering with the HPCSA as well. I mean, we're all on digital platforms now because of COVID, which is the catalyst for us, using things like Zoom and Teams and Google Meets and things like that, so... Um, yeah, something something to think about for, for future. Hmm. Now, That's Dr. Quinda, um, before, or maybe just at the start of lockdown, the, the, the HPCSA has been very clear on their positioning around telehealth and literally allowing for both known patients as well as new patients to use telehealth with their healthcare provider. And this was up until the end of the state of disaster, um, at which point I think the HPCSA was going to review their positioning, if I'm not mistaken. Now, this might be a bit of a sneaky question coming from me, but mm -hmm. if practitioners are, <laughs> do excuse me, if practitioners are acting responsible and within ethical guidelines, if they are trying to avoid supersessions, if they are not over-servicing, if they are not overcharging, do you think that the HPCSA positioning will be in favor of continuing their support for the use of telehealth even after the COVID-19 period? Uh, Lani, let me just put this clearly. When we develop the, the telemedicine guidelines, that's why they are called telemedicine <laughs> guidelines. Uh, remember in terms of our act, we, we are supposed to respond to the policy directives from the ministry. Mm -hmm. We need to support that. The act uh, stipulates that we need to perform certain acts in support of policy uh, directives of the ministry. And you know, that is where the issue of telemedicine started, to improve access. Mm -hmm. And sure. when it was introduced was to say, a patient in the periphery could be able to have access to a specialist. While they've got a practitioner on the other side, there is information about the patient that can be transmitted through technology mm -hmm. to the other practitioner. And a patient end up having access to a specialist through technology without having been able to travel. Mm. It was all about that. Yeah. But then our guidelines were based on that. That's why you will know that we released the first guide and then we modified it. I remember that. <laughs> so, so, so we're saying, at least if you know your patient, you can be able to assist your patient. And we changed it from telemedicine to telehealth. But the moment you said medicine, it's like now you are only restricting it to medical practitioners. That's why in the first one, although we repeated telepsychology twice instead of saying telepsychiatry, we're mm -hmm. saying, I mean, a psychologist can do therapy using telehealth. Mm -hmm. And we were bringing that context under COVID. That's why we said, now with COVID, you're going to have people who have never seen a health practitioner getting sick. Yeah. and requiring healthcare. Mm. Now, when you limit it to those who have an established relationship, then you are denying those who have never had a relationship with a health practitioner mm -hmm. to be able, because the issue of COVID, let's be honest, issues of anxiety and panic and all those things that comes with it. Yeah. One can benefit from consulting with a psychiatrist or a psychologist mm. and receive therapy. And a psychologist can be able to see the, the patient, you know, virtually and be able to provide psychotherapy for that particular patient or even counseling. So that's why we opened it up within the context of our ethical guidelines and our ethical rules. Mm. Now you ask a very critical question. Mm. That's why there are certain things that we specified. And I'm saying this because I'm the author of that particular document. So I know you're we'll talking to the right well. person. <laughs> why, 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 why we had to put certain things there mm. is because specifically on the issue of supersession, 
we, we are very much aware that there have been a serious drive from the funders to promote telemedicine. Mm -hmm. And it was based on that because what happens is that then when it's driven by the funders, then it takes you now to the issue of designated service provider networks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What you are likely to sit with because now if it's driven by the funders, the funders are able to say to their members, mm -hmm. uh, these are the people that are under our network and this is the platform that you can use to consult with them. Now, what happens to the patients of those who are not in the network? Mm -hmm. And that is where the issue of supersession comes in. Your mm -hmm. patients run away from you because you are not in the network. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is that the access is improved to a point where even if the person is not in the same city, now the patient can consult with that person uh, remotely. They don't have to come to a practice. So the issue of distance is no more an issue now. We need to guard against issues of supersession. Now, I, I can tell you, we are also protecting the business of practitioners because some of you will run out of business because your patients will be migrated to the practitioner who is in the network. So that's why we put in the issue of supersession to say, if your patients are taken away because you are not in the network and somebody does not inform you, then you can approach the HPCSA and report your colleague for supersession. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the issue of perverse incentives, we also guard against that because it is also open for abuse. Because then somebody can say, no, I've consulted with this patient virtually mm. and it never happened. Yep. And we cannot, I mean, we cannot run away from the fact that there are people who are still going to exploit these areas. So, the, and we say in all this, the issues of the adverts as well, you know, an ethical advertising where practitioners now will start to advertise this uh, unethically, you know, and all those kind of things, touting, issues of touting and, and, and so on. So those are some of the things that practitioners need to be aware of and one of the emphasis of that is that it does not take away the obligations that practitioners have towards their patient because now you are using a telehealth platform you still have the obligation to inform them about sure. the cost of services sure. issue them with a statement of account and so on mm -hmm. now now the question is, is mm -hmm. if practitioners really are behaving and they're acting ethically will the hpcsa consider to say oh maybe this works Mm. You, you, you know, the HPCSA, we, we, we are following what is happening, of course, globally, mm. the fourth industrial revolution and what technology is bringing. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we don't want to be left behind. Our ethical rules will remain to guide the professionals because as much as technology changes, ethics remains ethics. Mm. And, and I think, uh, as Dion said, uh, when our ethical rules says handwritten, we are able to advance in that because you have got the, the, the ECT Act that deals with the issue of how you can transmit information or data electronically in a protected way. Electronic signatures, does a signature have to be handwritten? We have got a law that deals with that. That's why we look at all these landscapes and say this law empowers us even from our practitioners. If your signature, which is electronic, is in line with the ECT Act, then we need to accept that. Yeah. So the same thing applies. I can tell you that there is a commitment from our Human Rights, Ethics and Practice Committee, which is a committee of counsel, to relook at those guidelines. For now, we have given you a guidance around the guidelines, but also to relook at the guidelines in view of the experience that we have had with COVID. And council, I mean, has changed the way of doing things. We have got a new normal now. Council is running meetings virtually, not face-to-face -face anymore. And there's a commitment to do more meetings virtually than physically. And which goes a long way of saving money and also not even hitting you hard on your annual fees. And we have seen this during COVID. Mm. And yeah. wh why can't we use whatever lessons that we have learned through COVID to change the way we do things? I think in thought, it's not like cancel is blind to what we are getting from technology and mm. that will be considered moving forward. Thank you. Wonderful. I must say, if I can just add in there, I think it's fantastic to see a, the, the way the HPCSA is um, stepping strongly into the guiding the professions uh, elements. 
Um, and secondly, the progressive nature of looking at uh, what the future of healthcare looks like and the regulation around that. Uh, within the ethical framework. I think that's quite exciting. I'm quite excited yeah. for the future. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. We, we we can continue this conversation, but we, we are running out of time. I don't mind carrying on, but I know certain people will have to leave. If I may ask the attendees for today's webinar, if I post a, a quick polling session, do you mind just quickly answering, did you find this webinar, the conversations on ethics with Dr. Quinda valuable, where it's a one to 10 score, one, no, you didn't enjoy it at all, or 10, it's fantastic. And then there'll be a short second poll, just say, would you like to see more of this? So I'm gonna launch the poll, I'm gonna give you a second or two, just to answer that if you don't mind. Um, maybe Dr. Quinda, I'm gonna come back to you just with some closing thoughts in a minute. Maybe you can just start thinking what you wanna say, Dion, as well as you. And then we'll, we'll start wrapping up. Um, while we wait for the poll to finish, Dr. Quinn, I would just really, really like to thank you again for joining us today. I know you're a very busy man and we're very grateful to, to have you with us. And if I may, can we perhaps knock on your door again to perhaps join us again in a, for a webinar in the future? <laughs> Lani, mm -hmm. if, if there's really one thing that I enjoy and, 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 and I think colleagues will have seen it, I. I've been running all over the country doing presentations. You know, I, I mean, there's no town that I've never been to. Yeah. And 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 for me, Elani, this platform uh, opened an opportunity for us to be able to engage any time, any time. And Wonderful. for me, uh, I'm happy with the way we have closed the gap as council. You know. I know practitioners do not like our motto, protecting the public and guiding the professions. So <laughs> please start, start. Of course we can't say we are protecting, it's not our duty to protect you, but at least starting by saying guiding the professionals while protecting the public may be more palatable. But you know, over, over the past four or five years, I think we have tried to close that gap through mm. our roadshows and through our, our, our symposium. Mm. And, and by the way, even with the HPCSA, we are considering doing now an online uh, 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 symposium now. Yeah. So for me, any time, Lani, I can say any time. Wonderful. As Thank long you. as we have got time and you tell me on time, I will make time to interact with practitioners. It's our duty. And I do this now, also, of course, also acting as the registrar. Uh, I'm positioned to understand the whole organization holistically. That's why I can say, Lani, one of the things that I, I think as practitioners... Oh dear. Oh, Lani, you're muted. You need to be proud of. I, I know this is infrastructure in the HPCSA to a point where, I mean, I released the staff on the 17th of March to go and work from home. Even our call center agents are answering their calls from home. I don't need them back in the office. More than 90% of my staff are able to, to carry out the business of the HPCSA from the comfort of their homes. Mm -hmm. and, and it is because of the kind of an ICT infrastructure that we have deployed in the organization. And that is your annual fees. But I can tell you, even some of the members of our ICT steering committee were saying, we need to take the lessons learned on how an organization survived during the lockdown from the HPCSA mm -hmm. and take it into the ICT magazines and journals. And, and, and other regulators, you can see they are still struggling, but from our side, really, our ICT in infrastructure has really helped us. That's why when I talk about, you know, really looking at the way we do business, even from our guidelines point of view, mm -hmm. we have seen practically how technology can enhance the way we do things. Mm -hmm. So I'm, oh. I'm a available anytime we just need to know on time and uh, um, I, I enjoy interacting with practitioners and talking oh, to them we can really only uh, empower each other I read. maybe even next time when COVID is over we can do this face to face <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> Dion, maybe just a, a closing message from your side before we will wrap up thank you Lonnie uh, and uh, yeah Dr. Kunde wants to say something else no 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 go, go on Dion right um, yeah, Lonnie, thank you. Dr. Quinda, thank you so much. I'm just scrolling through the comments as they're coming that's, through. That's amazing. Uh, like, uh, thank you for the friendly face representing the HPCSA, um, uh, uh, being able to reach out to the HPCSA behind the monolith. Um, 
the uh, it's just so positive and and we really really do value and appreciate your time and for being here it really is an honor um i took a chance um by by reaching out and asking you to join us and i'm so <laughs> pleased you accepted and we really really do appreciate that um i i trust i'll see you on sunday you might not see me but i'll see you online at your next sermon um, in your in your typical charismatic way so i look forward to that on sunday but i hope we see you on a thursday again as well Thank, 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 thank you, Dion. Thank you so much. Maybe just quickly those two email addresses again. It's mpo, m at hbcsa.co.za and professional practice at hbcsa.za. Attendees, just a quick reminder that this webinar, as well as all the previous webinars, are available on our website, easymed.solutions. Just navigate to the webinar tab and you will find all the links there. It's also the exact place where you can actually register for all our future webinars. And while we were talking about telehealth, um, it actually brings me into our next conversation during Thursday next week. I can't remember the date now. I think it's the 7th of July. We're going to be talking about telehealth again. But this time, we're going to have some practitioners with us live during the webinar who's been using telehealth during, before, and after the COVID um, pandemic. And they'll be sharing some of their tips and their telehealth experiences. So we're really looking forward to, to seeing as many faces as possible, virtually, obviously. We hope to see you all there, same time, same time, same, same place, next week, Thursday, 4 p.m. Please register on the webinar tab. Dr. Quinlan, Dion, it's been an absolute pleasure. We could definitely continue with this conversation and I think we will do so. To all the attendees, stay safe, stay well, and have a good night. Bye-bye.